Your new book comes out tomorrow. It's titled, But You Don't Look Arab and Other Tales of Unbelonging. And in it, you detail your experiences covering the Middle East, taking readers on a journey of self-discovery and political awakening that crosses borders and generations. In one section, you write about a cross-country trip you took in Syria back in 2005, just five years after Bashar al-Assad became president. You write, over the past few years, the country has been slowly modernizing and opening its borders to tourists and foreign investment after decades of isolation under former President Hafez al-Assad. Syrians were so starved for change that they chose to believe that a new generation of leaders who had lived and studied abroad would be likelier to set them free because they had tasted freedom themselves. In my hurried handwriting, I can see the seeds of the 2011 revolution when a young, mobile, ambitious generation of Syrians witnessed the Arab spring uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt and believed that they too could ask for more freedom and opportunity. Today, as I read my notes, I feel a quasi-physical pain, knowing that the hopes of the university students I interviewed that day were likely never realized. The country's youth would later be betrayed, shot, imprisoned, or ex exiled. They were sacrificed. It's that, Hala, you, you described so beautifully there that moment of hope that we saw in the Middle East, mm -hmm. only to be squashed, I mean, nowhere more brutally than Syria, where, of course, your parents came from. Absolutely. 2005 was when we started feeling and there was this kind of uh, impetus. Uh, young people were infused with this notion that they could speak out, that they could. And little by little, you started having in Egypt as well, these kind of um, private publications and magazines and young people who had studied abroad who chose to come back to the Middle East in order to work and live and, um, you know, have families and children there. That led to 2011. And 2011 was this very brief flash. It was almost like the flash of a photo of a, of a camera. And then everything just came crumbling back down. Uh, and as an Arab American, as someone whose parents were from Syria, I of course felt that emotional connection. It wasn't like being parachuted into a story where I had no cultural, social, or familial connections. So it was something really incredibly tragic when in the end, what um, these revolutionaries wanted to um, you know, get rid of, they wanted to overthrow these regimes, what came in their place was much, much worse. And unfortunately, some people have told me, you know, I wish this Arab Spring had never happened. It's something I talk mm. about in the book. Mm. E even though it's a trial run and we should, I'm sure, in the grand arc of history, we'll see that it really was a necessary step. What it led to, the destruction, the loss of family, the loss of land, is something so painful that some people have told me, I wish that we were back in 2010. Hala, it's Ali Vitali, and I want to double back to what we were talking about earlier with Israel and the ongoing mm -hmm. conflict there and in Gaza. I look at this usually from the domestic politics perspective, and so I'd be interested in applying that to your reporting internationally. What I've seen on the campaign trail is so many protests of Republican and Democratic contenders in the name of protecting Palestinian lives. Yeah. When you look at the way that that is overlaid with the ongoing negotiations that Andrea and Mark and everyone here at the table have talked about what does the domestic pressure look like on what someone like President Biden can sustain from Netanyahu and from the Israelis as these negotiations go on? Um, so I found that there's a fascinating difference between how this particular conflict, this war, this Israeli operation is viewed, especially among younger people, those people who have access to social media. If you compare it to 2014, this was the last large scale Israeli operation inside the Gaza Strip. There are so many more voices now covering this conflict and those voices and that coverage and that content, which is really on our phones is getting to younger people. And we see in so many alley of these domestic mm -hmm. campaign events, young people protesting the Biden administration's approach to its relationship with Israel, demanding a ceasefire. We're seeing also, and this is something I write about in my book, as far as Arab Americans, the Islamophobia, the rise in anti-Semitism, all this is, is creating a perfect domestic storm of pressure, not just on uh, the Biden administration, but on Western leaders across of Europe. I live in London. 
every single Saturday practically since October mm -hmm. 7th. We are seeing tens of thousands of people on the streets of the British capital asking for an immediate ceasefire. This um, new media landscape, social media, younger people, if you look at polling, very, very much more likely to be pro-Palestinian, to put it crudely, essentially anti-Israeli operation in the, in the Gaza Strip, much more likely than a decade ago. The, the, uh, the difference in how this conflict is being perceived by younger people uh, is absolutely immense just in the last 10 years. And it's one of the most important facets of covering this story, I think. The new book is your reporting, but it's also your personal story. I grew up mm -hmm. in the Middle East for 20 years. I can't wait to read it. Mm -hmm. It's called, But You Don't Look Arab and Other Tales of Unbelonging. It comes out tomorrow. Congratulations, Hala. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us on the program.